God, we see how majestic and mighty and awesome you are. You've created the universe. You created the galaxies. You created stars. You're uh, the king that rules on the throne. You have an angelic host that is before you. And yet you love us enough that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, your faith and trust in him that we can have eternal life and are adopted to your family. There's a love that we don't do not dis, dis deserve, Lord. Throughout your word, and especially even in the book of Malachi, you've declared your love for your people. But if we're honest and confess, Lord, we don't often respond to in kind. We often respond with doubt and fear and uh, misunderstanding of your love. Oftentimes we'll respond maybe in half-hearted worship or cutting quarters or corners, or we, we might respond by even ignoring the calling you place on each and every one of our lives, Lord. We just ask that where the, the, the spirit is willing and the, the flesh is weak, Lord, that we would confess that to you and rely upon you to fulfill your calling in each and every one of our lives. We ask as we look at your word today, Lord, uh, a word that you had spoke thousands of years ago to your people Israel, that it also applies to your church today, to uh, the, the leaders of the church, as well as to every member of the church, that you have a calling for each one of us, and there's a real seriousness when we fail to live up to what you have called us to do. So we just ask your spirit to work amongst us, to bring conviction where conviction is needed, encouragement where courage is needed, but most of all, we just want to leave here with a desire to be transformed by your spirit, to be more in the image and likeness of your son, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray, amen. Uh, I don't know if you know who Raphael is. Some of the kids might think in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's not the case. We're talking about Raphael, who's actually the, the Renaissance painter. He's, he was famous for painting uh, very realistic and beautiful uh, frescoes. Uh, one time when he was painting these frescoes, he was visited by two cardinals from the church who began to just start criticizing his work left and right. So remember, these are church cardinals. They're not, not artists. It'd be like me trying to go tell Bob Ross how ugly his paintings are. I, I just can't paint, right? I can't do it. So these cardinals are there and just responding and making superficial kind of foolish arguments. Uh, the criticisms they made were kind of brash, ignorant, without any understanding of art and his technique. Uh, and they really found fault in all that he did. One of the cardinals looks at Raphael and, and, said, and pointing at his uh, depiction of the Apostle Paul, and he says, he points and says, look, the Apostle Paul has too much red in his face. Raphael responded by saying, he blushes to see in whose hands the church have fallen. His implication was he knew how corrupt the cardinals and the system had become of religious leaders, and his point was, would not you know, Paul blush at what has happened to the the church. It's an easy as for us to look at the Israelites, and as we're looking at Malachi, or even looking back at Renaissance and the Catholic Church, and point fingers and say, "Aha! Look at that! Wouldn't, wouldn't they be ashamed?" But the thing is, is we have to really be honest with ourselves that if we actually even look at Protestant Christians, you know, those who are part of the Catholic Church who believe, you know, think the Bible is true, believe you're only saved by grace in Jesus Christ, would he maybe he not be a little ashamed of where we've come as a church as a whole? I'm not talking to individual believers or individual churches. I'm talking collectively, especially in the West. The thing is, we have churches that are really full of, of immature believers, believers who don't know their Bible, believers who think tolerating sin is this good thing. Look how awesome we are. Uh, we accept things that God says is, is unholy. The thing is, is the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The thing is, if you look in the Bible, the Bible often will go to, you know, again, people have a responsibility for how they think and feel. But a lot of times, it's just a reflection of what they're getting from the pulpit or getting from the spiritual leaders. If the spiritual leaders start falling in their call, did you know that the church as a whole, they start falling in their call as well? Because it starts with the spiritual leaders. And in America, we have have so many spiritual leaders uh, of different, very sorts of kinds, not looking at biblical standards, that we wonder why how we get where we are. Uh, my heart's broken. Um, you know, I've seen church services, and the men's study actually showed this video where this one church did this Easter service, and they're putting in quotation marks, and they basically did this reenactment and reimaginization of crucifixion and all that, that was no different than like a pagan kind of ritual, something you would see like at a nightclub, it had all that kind of stuff in it. And would God not weep, and we wonder why the church is full of people who do not follow Christ and are willing to live immoral 
lives. We have churches that are, are full of, of people that teach, you know, if you come to come to God, that everything's going to be hunky-dory, it's always going to be great, and you, it's all about you living your best life now, which is not biblical. And the problem is we wonder why we have churches full of people that are going after prosperity and money and all those things and not following God's given call for life when it's coming from the spiritual leaders. But here's the thing. The thing is, is even good spiritual leaders, and I was grieved this week that um, another well-known pastor uh, figure in, in, in Christendom has, has also fallen. Um, this individual has been very uh, key. He's written a lot of books, and they're all very sound doctrine, and bringing people back to the scriptures and all that. And it's come to light that he, he had a relationship, been having an inappropriate relationship. He's in his 70s with like a 20-year-old girl. And the thing is, is what scares me is when I look at this person, it's easy for me to judge, but actually what I'm thinking is, if this guy who knows all this doctrine and is so well established and in the ministry, if he has fallen, who am I to think I am any different? The thing is, as we've been looking at Malachi, we've been seeing that Israel and the spiritual leaders are wayward, not because of just outright sin, but because they were serving God half-heartedly. The thing is, if, if pastors and congregations, if we don't guard our heart and pursue after God's calling, something else is going to take its place. And what's going to creep in is half-hearted worship, rejection of God, rejection of holiness, and you're going to have immature churches because you have immature believers because you have either immature spiritual leaders or spiritual leaders that have not spent so much time guarding themselves thinking that they cannot fall. And it grieves my heart to see this. And, and we can't have cast fingers and look at other churches. The thing is, it has to start with us. The thing we have to understand is if David can fall, man after God's own heart, who would you think we're any different? Whether you're a pastor or just sitting in the pew, right? The thing is, we don't, uh, if we don't pursue God's call in our life, whether we are an elder or just a church member, and I'm putting that in quotations, Mark, because did you know God never views anyone as just a church member? We're going to see today that he's given not only call to spiritual leaders, but everyone he has given a call to. And if every one of us fails, whether you're a spiritual leader or you're a member of the congregation, if you fail to pursue God's calling, I'm not saying they're going to do it perfectly, but if you fail to do it and are unintentional and just half-hearted in doing it, not only will you fail, but it has consequences that spread to the rest of the church. Rest of the, church. the thing is, is, we have to understand, we have this, comp this thing that we think that if I sin or if I fail my calling, it's only going to affect me. That is not biblical. In the Bible, we read this in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. In the context of 1 Corinthians, if you remember, is in 1 Corinthians, this is the chapter where the church was bragging about how loving and tolerant they were. They were so, so tolerant, they allowed sexual perversion and sin in the church, accepted in it, praised it, and what was going on in this church is that this man was sleeping with his father's wife. Which God says, this is, this is incorrect. This is bad sexual practice. This is forbidden by God. But the church tolerated it and accepted that. The thing is, is we now have churches that will accept other standards besides God's for sexuality and family. I'll let you think about what those are. I don't even have to expel them out because we know this is so prevalent, right? The thing is, is that the church has allowed this. The spiritual leaders of the church allows this. And he says, that, you know what? Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? I don't even know if you know anything about making bread. If you put a little leaven in the bread, you can't stop that thing from spreading. Did you know that? It'll eventually spread to the whole mass of dough, right? You, you can't stop it. And here he's talking about the church as a whole, that not one church member is saying if a church member sins, it can spread to the whole bunch. It affects everyone. And it's especially true if you are the leader of the church or called to be a spiritual leader. If that spiritual leader sins and has sin in their life or reject God's calling, that's going to spread like wildfire in the church. And again, I'm not casting stones because I have to look at myself every day and say, am I fulfilling God's call in the way he's called me to? And I confess, church, that I'm not perfect. I fail you and I fail God every day. But we're not talking about living in perfection. We're talking about people who just don't care. And, you know, but a little incremental was, you know what the pastor was mentioning? I don't think he woke up one day and said, you know what? Today I'm going to commit adultery. I don't even think David woke up that morning and said, you're going to commit adultery today. If you actually look at it, it's a small pattern 
of not guarding his heart. In David's case, God called him to go out to the battlefield, and he said, you know what? I don't feel like going today. He sent everyone else out. So he didn't fulfill God's calling where he was supposed to be, and since he wasn't fulfilling God's calling, he had to come up with stuff to do. I don't know about you, when I'm by myself and I'm not fulfilling God's calling and I have to invent something to do, nine times out of the ten, it's the wrong thing. Maybe it's just me. But then David was idle. He wasn't following God's calling. He was just sitting there. He looked out and saw the sheep and he said, and I don't think this, this pastor I'm talking about woke up one day and just said, you know what, I'm going to commit sin. And it's easy for him to say, oh, look, he has an evil, wicked heart. We all have that wicked heart. It takes one moment of putting our guard down, one moment and not fulfilling God's calling or not taking it seriously for that to spread, not just in our lives, but guess what? It affects everyone around us. It affects everyone around us. Well, I'm not a spiritual leader. It doesn't affect everyone around us. The thing is, is if you have a family, friends, or a job, your sin will affect every one of those things around you. Did you know that? And also, worse yet, it affects the name of Christ because if people know you're Christian, whether or not you're a pastor or an individual, if you fail, it's not just you that suffers. It's the name of Christ that suffers. So God's calling to us is very serious. As we've been working through the book of Malachi, we've seen that first in chapter 1, God has declared his love. He says, I love you. And it's not just nation Israel because in Christ God loves us. Amen. He says, I have loved you. And we saw that what happened was is that the nation of Israel started doubting God's love because they had an expectation of how God is supposed to, to love them. And they love them if we're, the way they wanted God to love them if we're actually honest is the way prosperity gospel message is. You know what, God, you promised health, wealth, and power. And I'm not seeing these things. But we saw that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that when we're enemies, Christ died for us when we were sinners. Amen? That if he does nothing else, God demonstrated his love in Christ. And he loves us because he says he loves us. He doesn't lie. And he demonstrated his love to the, to the Israelites in the fulfillment, of the fulfillment of the covenant, the old covenant, and to us in the new covenant of Christ. Amen? And the thing is, is we saw that because he doubted, his love, they began worshiping. They not, didn't really respond with love to the Lord. They actually started worshiping with half a heart. And it was in, half-hearted in everything. When they did the sacrifices, they were willing to, to give God their, their second best. Even not their second best. They would bring their blind, lame, and deformed lambs, even though God's word said that this is not the sacrifice. And we saw that that incrementally, we even see that the, the priests were like, well, well, what's in it for me? The only reason why they want to serve it was hard. It's difficult being a spiritual leader. And they're like, well, where's, where's my material blessings? Where's these promises? This, what's in it for me? The moment you ask about ministry, what's in it for me? And I'm just as guilty. I have to be cautious of this. Is you are going to not guard your heart. You're going to go off the wrong way. And we see that's what happened. As they started uh, giving God half a heart. That spread down to the people. The people were worshiping God with half a heart. Now, we have to understand that actually, uh, I, blatant idolatry, like we had in, in uh, pre exilic times, you know, when they're worshiping Baal on the one hand and God on the other hand, after the exile, we don't see that type of idolatry. But what you will see is the idolatry that we have. I'm not worshiping an idol, but we're worshiping what? Wealth, health, those types of things. And so if I don't get these things, end up worshiping God with half a heart. We see that the people were reflecting what was the attitude in the hearts of the priests or those who are called to be the spiritual leaders. And so today as we look at uh, chapter 2, we're going to see God's message to spiritual leaders. And before you tune out and say, well, I'm not a spiritual leader, I will tell you this. One, you're in charge of choosing who your spiritual leaders are. You're in charge of picking the church you go to and which type of spiritual leader that you're going to be under. Which, by the way, is a leadership decision, isn't it? <laughs> you have to at least lead that much. But here's the other thing we have to understand. In the New Testament, God has not called just elders to the ministry. God has called every believer as a calling in their life. Amen. So in some aspect, you're a spiritual leader. If you are a parent, you are definitely called to be a spiritual leader. You may not be leading Bible studies in the church, but you are a spiritual leader to those children in your household. Husband, you're supposed to be a spiritual leader to your whole family. You're called to it. Well, I don't have any of those things. Well, you're the spiritual leader that people in the lost world who don't know Christ, that you need to share them with them because you're going to be able to meet people that I can't meet. You see how every one of us in some aspect is called to a spiritual leadership? The thing is, is just as elders and spiritual leaders and priests, if they neglect God's calling in their life, it's a disaster for the body of Christ. But also, if you ignore God's calling for you, you see how much of a disaster that can be as well? It's because you can bring just as much hurt 
So we're going to take a look today at God's message to spiritual leaders, which again is not just the priests and the elders, but it's to each and every one of us as God's called each and every one of us. So let's take a look at Malachi chapter 2, and I'm going to read the uh, section we're looking at today, which is verses 1 through 9. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to your heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offering and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi might stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned away many from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, insomuch you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. So we see here that God is going to turn uh, in Malachi to a message specifically to the priests, to those who are called the spiritual leaders of, of the land. And because of their failure, it's reflected in the people of Israel. Because the people are only going to be reflecting what their spiritual leaders, what they reflect. And the first thing I want you to notice as we look in this passage is I want you to see the seriousness of not fulfilling God's calling. It is a big, God says it's a very serious matter if you do not fulfill his calling in your life. And it's especially true of spiritual leaders. The thing is, is I don't think we understand how serious it is. We don't treat God's call in your life like we treat anything else. The thing is, many of us will give honor and respect to our managers at work that we would not give to God if we're honest with ourselves. Well, it's okay for me to, to consistently be late, to give half a heart, because that's just church. We do it with our actions. We might not say that and confess that, but if we're honest with ourselves, including me, is we have those actions that don't take it as seriously as something else in my life. Well, you know what? My manager can fire me. Well, you know what? The Bible says the Lord can send my soul to hell. Why don't I take him seriously? God takes this calling for spiritual leaders and for each one of us very serious. This is a very serious matter, and I don't think we understand how much that is. And the reason why is that song we sung is, Behold Our God. The thing is, is we don't really behold the God of the Bible. We start beholding the God that we've invented. Well, God is love. Yes, that is true. He's also holy, holy, holy. The Bible in the verse will say God is love with just one word love, and the rest of the Bible will say God is holy, holy, holy. He is creator. He is God. He is sovereign. He is king. He is Lord of the universe. He deserves your respect. He deserves your awe. And when he gives you a call in your life, that is not an option. That is the king giving you a command. And the thing is, is by us not taking it serious, that doesn't reflect what, uh, about God's heart. That reflects our own heart. What we're saying is, is I, God, I show more respect and more awe and more reverence to my manager at work than you. And to be honest, sometimes we do that because the manager has a real tangible, immediate effect. And with God, his effects are a little more long-term. But by the way, the long-term stuff is actually worse, right? It's actually more harsh. And I'm not saying God doesn't love us. What I'm saying is, is we are, don't respond to God with the awe and respect. Is we don't take the calling seriously because we do not take God seriously. And he says, now, O priest, this command is for you. Now, let me tell you what the word command means. It's a Hebrew word. It's very technical. Command in Scripture means command. All right? It's very technical. It means it is not an option. And throughout Malachi, we see a very interesting word that refers to God. He calls him the Lord of hosts. Yahweh, I am the covenant form of God's name, of hosts. and is a military term referring to the commander of heavenly armies. So what he's saying is, it's just like in the army, if the God puts a call on your life, it is not optional. It is a command. And if you disobey God's calling, you disobey his command. If you disobey his command, guess what you're in? Sin. 
to sin, to disobey God's calling. I'm not saying that you're not forgiven, that he doesn't love you. I'm saying your heart reflects the fact that you don't respect him as a military commander, as the Lord of hosts, and you're saying, you know what? I, I, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. I was in the army. They asked me consistently to do things I didn't want to do, nor did I think that I could do. And I was surprised to see that I can actually follow the command in my training and I was able to do it. How much more the people of God, when God calls you to do something, in His power of His Holy Spirit will you be able to do it. Amen? We need to start taking it seriously. God takes it seriously. This says that the calling to the spiritual leaders is a command. But if you're in the pews and you think yourself just, I'm exempt from this, you're not. God has a calling for every one of us and His calling is not optional. Because when a commander gives you a command and you say, well, I don't feel like doing it, that is disobedience and it's actually treason. Not treason to your country, but treason to God. Again, sin. God takes it very seriously. He says, if you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, he says, look, if you're going to ignore me and not listen, and I don't mean just listen with your, with, with just your mouth, you know? He's like, if you're not listening with your heart, you know the difference, right? If you have kids, you know the difference. You tell your kid to do one thing, there's a different response in your own heart when your kid says, you know what, I love you, Dad, I'm going to do what you asked me to do, versus, oh, I guess I can do that. Right? That's not doing it with your whole heart. Amen? He says, you need to take it to heart. Give it to your heart. Put it on your side. Internalize it. It says, again, the Lord of hosts. There it is. The commander. He says, you need to give honor to my name. He reminds them that the point of the calling is not your benefit to bring glory to God's name. And we saw throughout the first chapter of Malachi that they didn't care about God's name. What they cared about was their best life now. And it's easy to point our finger, but for honest with ourselves, we do the same. We say, you know what, my, my best life now is more important, and I view it as, as an option. He takes it very seriously. He says, and he's not serious the Lord takes it. He says, he said, don't do this. Then I will set the curse upon you, and I'll curse your blessings. He tells the priest, you know what, if you're going to keep ignoring me, and these are God's people, it's God's spiritual leaders. And if he's going to do this to his spiritual leaders, are, is anyone exempt? No. This is the priest of God's chosen people. He says, if you do not take this to heart, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Now, there's some scholarly ar argument about what blessings are they talking about. In the context, it could mean one of two things. It could either mean the blessing is meaning that God promised the priest that they'd be able to live off the tithe of the land, so the material blessings that they're getting, God's going to curse. But also in context, the word actually could also mean this. Priests were tasked with giving blessings to people. And he's saying that if you're going to pretend to serve me and you're going to bless other people, I'm going to turn those blessings into curses. And so there's an argument. People are like, well, well it's this one, it's that one, it's this one. You know, I dare say, if you ever read the Bible, God is able to encompass many applications in just a few words. Amen. Why not both? The thing is, he's saying that, you know what? I'm going to turn those material blessings that you so crave, I'm going to shove them back in your face as curses. And when I read this, my, my, one of my favorite ironic passages in this kind of scary Bible is, is we look at the Old Testament when the Israelites, uh, they are... Uh, they are leaving the promised land. God's given all this manna from heaven. And their first response is to start complaining. They're like, it'd be like, you know, they're treating God like he's a wife that keeps serving the same type of food every day. And so they're receiving bread, manna from heaven. They're like, oh, manna again? Don't you got anything else, God? God's like, be careful what you ask for. So God sends all this quail in. Now they have this meat. And they're making quail burgers and eating all this meat. And God says, that's going to be a curse because you're going to vomit that through your nostrils. So they got all sick and they started vomiting out because they're eating so much of this blessing, material blessing that they thought was from God. They started vomiting out and getting sick and dying. I know that sounds they're like, well, that's horrible. The Bible is very graphic. We have a tendency in English to tone stuff down. I mean, later we're going to get to talking about dumb. Remember, I just read that. <laughs> but the thing is, is God's saying, I'm going to turn those blessings to curses for you. How many spiritual leaders have you seen where the material blessings they received have become their curse? They get in financial trouble. 
There was one uh, Bible study we used to do with a, a pastor. We kind of stopped using the material because he felt his falling wasn't marital infidelity. His falling was he was cooking the books and using the money. Right? Temptation. I'm not saying it's easy to judge him, but the thing is, little foxes. He didn't guard his heart. He didn't fulfill God's calling. But the other option is true, too. If I'm, I'm serving God with half a heart, do you really want me to bless and pray for you? Is God going to be listening to me? My blessings will be pointless. My prayers for you would be pointless. God's saying, you know, you're a hypocrite. I don't, I'm not really listening to you. They're like, well, doesn't the Bible say God always listens? That's not biblical. There are points where even God told the prophet Jeremiah, these people are so wicked, I don't even want you to stop praying for them. I don't hear their prayers. They're past the point of no return. We always forget that God is love, yes, but he's also holy. And so we should take his calling seriously because you know, our blessings can become cursing. He takes it seriously because his blessings can be turned into a curse. He says, indeed, I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I rebuke your offerings spread down on your faces. The dung of the offerings, you shall be taken away with it. Now, let me explain that one. It sounds like, what's God saying that? He's going to rub poop all over these people's faces? Yes, but you have to understand Bible context. Here's what happens. When a sacrifice was given, they would take all the, the dung, the excrement, and all the nasty parts of the sacrifice, and they were required by the law to package that all up, you know, pack up your trash. They were to take it outside of the camp, outside of God's people, and they were to burn it. Right? That's, that's the connotation. He said, you priests have let garbage in, and your hearts now reflect garbage. And here's the thing. It's a very serious thing. What is he saying here? He says, I'm going to take that, that refuse that you're giving me, and I'm going to rub that all over your face, and I'm going to take you outside the camp to be burned. That's a pretty serious statement from the Lord. He takes it seriously. I know we read that. It sounds, it sounds funny and gross. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be harsh because God is trying to teach them a hard truth in hopes that they repent. It's in hopes that they repent. Remember, it starts off with this, the, the, the statement, if you will not listen to me. And this is his last attempt because he says here, I'm already starting the judgment. Remember, we read it. I'm already starting it. Your curses are already, your blessings are already turning to curses. Turn. Even at this point, he says, you're almost at the point of no return. If you do not repent, there is a consequence, and I'm going to take you outside of the camp and burn you. Now, I don't know if this, it's easy for us to say, well, he's talking about hell. I don't know if that's the case, but how many uh, spiritual leaders who have fallen have their ministries, their churches, their families, their lives just been taken out and burned by not taking God's calling seriously? And it's easy to look at spiritual leaders, but how many believers do you know that ignored God's calling in their life and did the same? God takes his calling and us not fulfilling it very seriously, and we need to take it seriously as well. So what are some applications for you? First thing I'll say is this. If you want to become a spiritual leader, if you feel God calling you to be a spiritual leader, it's a worthy calling, but it's hard. It is hard. And it's not even just hard for you. I was talking to Pastor George. It's hard on your families. Because people start holding my wife into children to standards that are unrealistic. Here's the thing. I am a pastor of the church. I'm the one that's here in leadership. My children and my wife are not. Not that my wife is, my wife is a good minister. She's, she ministers for the Lord. She's called her ministry. But she is not called to be the elder pastor. It is me. So the thing is, is I, I might get mad if you got for my wife and children. But that being said, is it's hard being a spiritual leader. It doesn't matter what leadership God has called you to. James tells us this, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach be judged with greater strictness. Yes, we are all going to be judged by Christ by what we've done in the flesh. But here's the scary thing for me, Pastor George, is we're going to actually be judged for some of the things you choose to do based upon what we have done to try to serve and encourage you. And that's a scary thought. God, the Lord's going to hold me accountable for every word I say up here. And I know sometimes after I preach up, I'm like, I can't believe I said that. That wasn't even in my notes. I probably shouldn't have said that. And I'm going to be held accountable for it. And yes, it is it's scary because it is a serious calling. The problem is not many spiritual leaders understand this. And then we'll view, just like the priest is, well, I'm going to be pastor of church because it's a cool job. I get to just work once a week. Sunday morning, I preach. If that's your view of being a pastor or an elder, you better get out of the 
I was going to say business, but that would be a Freudian slip. This is not a business, amen? Being a spiritual leader is hard. You need to count the cost if you're going to want to be a spiritual leader. And interestingly, this is a side note. I had one guy that I was ministering to, was trying to disciple. Um, he refused to read his Bible. The only place he got his, his theology from is watching movies like Dogma. We're not even talking about Christian movies. We're talking about secular movies. He wanted to be, so like, you want to be a Bible study teacher? I said, okay, well, I was open to it. It's like, well, we can meet one-on-one. I can pray with you. We can start studying some scripture, learning doctrine. He's like, no, I don't want to do that. It's too much work. I'm like, well, then I don't want you teaching Bible ever. <laughs> ever. Because you just view it as a status or something no different. We've got to view that calling some serious. And if you seriously think God's calling you to be a spiritual leader, do not take it lightly. That's all I'm saying. And you might be thinking, well, the reason why I'm not stepping up is because I don't feel like I'm equipped. A little, little, little secret. God does not call the equipped. Because if you look yourself, you're equipped for nothing. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. The Bible says we're dead. What do dead people do? Nothing. The Christ says, in me, you will bear much fruit. But he will equip the call. If God's called you, he will equip you. All you're supposed to do is stay in that root. Guard your heart. The things that we're talking about today. So consider the way before we become a leader of God's people. But also, remember that if you don't feel called to be an elder in the church, you're not exempt from a calling of God in your life. You need to take God's calling for you seriously. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen race. This is, again, talking to all believers. If you're sitting in this room and put your faith and trust in Christ, this is you. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Says, if you've been called into his kingdom of marvelous light, guess what? You're not only a kingdom, but every one of you are priests. That's one difference between what the Bible teaches, and I know some churches teach that priests are, priests are somehow elevated, pastors are somehow elevated. They also have these committees in terms of someone's a saint. The Bible says if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. Someone who is sanctified, set apart for God. This verse says every one of us, if you're a believer, you are a priest. So if we're reading a passage in the Old Testament that's talking to priests, it's not just to the elders who is a priest. It's a priest now. According to this, every one of us. God has called every one of us to be a priest. He's given us each a calling. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship. I love this word workmanship in, in Greek. The word is poema. It's where we get a word poem. It's saying that we are God's artistic uh, craftsman masterpieces. If you don't like poetry, for those of you that like swords, it's like a master swordsman craft. It makes, you know, there are swords that are just things you beat people, and then there are works of art, right? He says that you are God's workmanship. You're, he is making you into his masterpieces. Created Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. He says that Jesus has called every one of us not just to be saved and get out of hell free card, but has given us all each a calling for some type of good work. In your life, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to pretend to. But God has called you for good work, which he prepared before him that we should walk in them. What that means is before you were even born, God has said, you know what, I have, I have a purpose for that person. And all I have to do is, is walk in it. Walk with me and walk in it. That's your choice, right? But he is a calling on your life. Which means if I'm not fulfilling God's calling, I'm not walking with him. I'm walking on my own. And that's a scary place to be. You need to take that calling seriously. And again, that's why Pastor George and I are here, and we try to do this as best we can. But again, we don't know God's calling in your life. But Ephesians 4 also says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the the pastors, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work and minister for the building up of the body of Christ. Our job is to equip you biblically, disciple you, so you will fulfill God's calling in your life. But guess what? We can't do that for you. We can help you, but we can't do it for you. I will add one other thing at this point. If you have a, there's a difference between constructive criticism, which I will take, and then just complaining and mumbling, which I kind of turn off. You know, sometimes when God puts a, a complaint in your heart, you see a need, it might be God saying, hey, maybe you can step up and fill it. Pastor George and I, you know, we have full-time families, full-time jobs, 
you know, a lot of people say, well, it's easy for you to read the scriptures, Pastor. That's your whole job. I, I have a full-time family, full-time job. That's the one thing I like about it is because you can't accuse me of those things. <laughs> I wish I had not so we could do full-time ministry, but that's okay. This is what God has called us to. We, we bear that, that cross and do what God's called us to do. But the thing is, is he has made a calling to you to step up. And that complaint might be God's calling. So if you have a complaint, we're going to say, okay, well, what are you going to do about it? You know what usually we get? It's always, well, it's not my calling. It, you know, it's not my ministry. I'm not in the ministry. I have a full-time job. And when you look at me, I can just be able to now because I have a full-time job. I can laugh at your face. And I'm just teasing. <laughs> because it's, I, you can't use that excuse on me right now, right? The thing is, God has given you a calling, and you need to step up. And the thing is, is if you don't fulfill God's calling, not only are you getting hurt, but did you know God's church is getting hurt because you have left a void that possibly he was calling you to fill. We need to take our callings seriously, whether you're not a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, or I'm just a guy that sits in the pew. God has called all of us to a calling. So we see the seriousness of not fulfilling God's calling. We're also going to see the command to fulfill God's calling. God is now, uh, in Malachi, he's going to tell the priests what he expects of them, what they are called to, all right? And so he's going to call each of us our own calling, but we see what he's going to call uh, the spiritual leaders here, too, as we look starting in verse uh, 4 through 7. He goes on to say this, So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, He's saying, because of these consequences of your blessings becoming curses, you now know that this is a command that I sent you. It's not, a, it's not an option. That my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. Now, you might be thinking, well, what's this covenant with Levi? Uh, some people are kind of arguing about it. I don't see any real covenant of Levi specified anywhere. But we have to understand is a lot of times a covenant made with one person in Scripture ends up applying to all their descendants. For example... God gave Abraham a covenant. Who did that apply to? All of his descendants. God gave um, David a covenant saying, I will make you king eternally. We see that fulfilled in Jesus Christ and his descendants. Um, if you do want to get into this, uh, this covenant is actually in Numbers 25, I believe. I don't have time to go over the whole thing, but we have here, and shortly after the Exodus, the people are starting to worship both Baal, and they're worshiping, trying to worship God and Baal at the same time. Now, Baal, you may be thinking, oh, that's just some esoteric thing. Baal, we eventually get Baal's above, so who are they really worshiping? Baal's above is another name for Satan. They're, worship, they're worshiping Satan and God at the same time. It's really what they're doing. They're trying to mix and match this worship. Um, and actually what we have is, uh, in Israel, we have this intermarriage thing where people were taking their covenant with God seriously. And so what they were doing is the, the guys were saying, you know what, these spiritual Israelite women are just a little too uptight. So they were going out and taking Baal worship women to their beds and forsaking their wives and those types of things. You're shaking your head, right? But, but it's horrible, isn't it? But that's what we all do this if we're honest. If we're, we just don't think we're doing it this bad. But this is what they're doing. They weren't taking it seriously. And God started setting a plague upon his people. And a number of Israelites were just dying. And the only reason why God stopped is that um, one of God's priests, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron. So Aaron is the priest who is a Levite. He's the high priest. And he has a son named Eleazar, and he has a son named Phineas. Phineas took his calling seriously. And, and, and so what he does is he goes to the tents of all these people that are committing these sins, and it sounds harsh. But he went there and he killed the girl, the guy, to wipe it out. He took it, he took it seriously. Now, I'm not justifying murder and us killing sinners in the church. That's not what I'm saying. But what God does is because he took it seriously, he promises that he would be priest forever and that he would have a covenant of peace and prosperity. And part of that covenant is he would be able to live on the Levitic covenant, which means because they're priests, their inheritance is the land is the Levites actually didn't get land, is that the people would give their tithe to the temple and they were able to live off that tithe. That was the covenant of peace. The covenant he gave to them is, look, because... You were in awe of me and feared me and revered me and honored me. That's what you're called to do. He says, I'm going to reciprocate 
and you're going to be my priest, and you're going to do this thing. And, and that he will be the priest and he will give him the blessings and all that and peace and all those things. What we see in Malachi is the priest saying, we don't revere your name. We don't honor you, but we want you, God, to uphold your side of the bargain. We want you to give us all these things, but we're not going to revere your name. So they rejected that calling he's given the priest. The priest's primary function was to revere and awe and reverence to God and encourage that amongst the people. Amen. And they turned their back on that covenant. They turned their back on that calling. They turned their back on that calling. So as we take a look here, as I said, so you shall have said this command that my covenant will be by my sand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, which we went over, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of what? Of fear, and he feared me. Now, I'm not talking about fear in the I'm afraid he's going to smite me sense, but the fear you have of reverence and awe for the God of the universe who created everything. Yes, does God love me? But he's not just my friend. I have to treat him with an, an idea of respect and awe and fear. And the priest said, you know what, I don't do that. Spiritual leaders have to promote the fear and awe of God. He stood in awe of my name. In other words, he respected me, and because he respected my name and was stood in awe of me, that he went to glorify my name wherever he went. That's the primary duty of a spiritual leader, is to promote a reverent fear and awe for God. How does that compare to what's coming from our pulpits today? Our pulpits are, Jesus is, God wants you to live your best life now. He's there if you rub the lamp, he's going to give you your, your good things and tidings. Is that reverence or awe? That's not all. That's not treating him as a king of the universe, as a general. That's treating him as a genie. That's not reverence and all. The primary thing is to have a reverent fear and awe for God. And the reason why so many people, so many believers and congregations don't have a reverent fear of awe of God is because their spiritual leaders don't. They treat God as something trivial or just like us. He's my pal. He is, you know, we forget the holiness of God. So they failed in that primary calling. They did not seek the glory of his name. They, they didn't promote the all of God's name because the focus became on their kingdoms and their name. We wonder why we have too many churches with immature believers who are all about themselves because a lot of spiritual leaders that claim to be are also about themselves. Now, before you resolve yourself, that's not true of everyone. I've also been in churches where the pastors try very hard and the people's hearts are hard, are hardened, right? What I'm saying is I see a lot of spiritual leaders promoting material, health, wealth, and about my kingdom now and not the glory of God's name. And they wonder why people aren't consumed by God's name and his glory because the leaders of the church aren't consumed by it. He goes on to say this. True instruction was in his mouth. This is talking about in the Hebrew word there is Torah. That he was, they preach God's truth, his word, and his whole truth. Amen? They, they preach the whole word of God. And unfortunately, we live in a culture where that's not the case. The thing is, is I, I've read this so much. They were like, oh, we have seven steps to how to make your church grow and become popular with a lot of people. I'll tell you this, if your church is popular in the world, there's a reason. Because you're preaching the things of the world. The thing is, God has called his spiritual leaders to teach and preach God's whole truth, whether or not it's popular or not. I'm sure Malachi wasn't someone that got invented to parties, right? Because he'd go and say, well, you're not loving God enough, and you're not, who wants that, right? The thing is, spiritual leaders are called to preach God's word, regardless of that's what the world thinks. But there are too many spiritual leaders out there, in quotation marks, that are very popular. And sometimes we get mad at name names, but we're going to see later that Paul names names. For example, Andy Stanley, who embraces tolerance of sexual sin, but he will say things, well, we need to unhitch New Testament Christianity from the Old Testament. In other words, let's forget the law in the Old Testament. We also say things, well, instead of saying the word of God says, I'll say things, well, according to Paul's word in this book, which means he has a low view of scripture, a low view of God's word, and he's willing to go ahead and choose the way of the world. In fact, he actually even mentioned, I heard him from his own mouth, that he was, 
he was he had leaders, youth leaders coming to him asking him, they're like, we have all these teenagers and parents coming who say that they're transgender and, and, and gay and all these things. We don't know how to we don't know how to deal with them. What should we do? Did he go to the Bible? God's word? No. He said, Well, I had to go to a good source. So he talked to basically gay people. I must say there's that they're less than human, then that's where he went to to say how to deal with this. People who accept and tolerate that. We take the people who accept and tolerate this and pro propagate this and elevate this and are proud of this, and that's what I'm going to go to for how to deal with people. Instead of going to God's word. We don't take God's word seriously. I've often been accused of, Pastor Darrell, you use way too much Bible in your sermons. Right? You don't want to hear a word from me. Ask my wife. My words are sometimes irritating. A lot of times they're wrong. <laughs> but God's word isn't. We need to be Spiritual leaders need to teach the whole of God's word instead of teaching half truths and myths. Myths. He goes on to say, "True instruction is found, and no wrong was found on his lips." In other words, he's he's not teach, preaching iniquity. He's not teaching things that are made up by man or humans. He is focusing on preaching the word of God. I've been to, to so many other churches. I went to one church as we were church shopping when we moved to the Dallas Fort Worth area. But using that phrase, that says something, huh? When we say that, I, you know, I'm church shopping, we treat it like anything else. <laughs> but we're going around, and the pastor didn't even preach from God's word. He spent two hours telling stories from his life, and like 20 minutes on some type of illustration for some kid's cartoon. No word of God mentioned. But he's using words made up by, by men. And he goes on to say, he walked with me in peace and uprightness. He says, this is someone who's going to want to walk with God and live in peace in his peace the way he determines it and walk in righteousness. Again, he's not perfect, but he's trying to live for Christ in all that he's doing. He's making the attempt. This is what God has called the spiritual leaders to do. Because if they fail, everyone fails. He goes on to say, and he turned many from iniquity. What that means is the priest will preach the truth, live the truth, and try to project and preach that to people so they would repent, turn away from their sins, and come to God. He's not there to be popular and not to be liked. He's to turn them away from iniquity because where does iniquity always lead? To death and destruction. For the lips of the priest should guard knowledge. And basically he's saying this is the point of the priest is he needs to guard knowledge. Talking about knowledge of God. He needs to be like the, the watchman on the wall to get rid of false teachers, to point false teachers out, to even kick them out if they try to preach in their, in their churches or Anyone who's, I'm not saying having a difference of opinion, but they're preaching anything other than the word of God except it's completely untrue. You better hope I'm going to beat them away with a stick. Amen? This is what he's called spiritual leaders to do, to guard knowledge. And people should seek instruction from their mouth. He said these should be people that are preaching God's word and that are encouraging people to get in God's word, who have a thirst for God's word, that they want to come to hear God's word. My prayer is that when you come is that you hope to get instruction, not from me, but from God's word, amen, as we preach it, as we preach it. He says this, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. He's not a messenger of self, but the priest, the spiritual leader, is a messenger of the Lord of hosts, the messenger of God who is general over the host of the heavenly army, Amen. Which means, by the way, I try to be accountable to you as much as I am, but I'm not primarily accountable to this church. You know what I'm primarily accountable to? It's the Lord that's calling in my life. Now, some people use that to go do whatever they want to do and say, you know, above reproach. But the thing is, I have to remember that when I get criticism and things like that. I have to say, is this real criticism or is this just complaint? Because ultimately, I'm responsible to the Lord as his messenger. Amen? And again, this is true of, of the Old Testament Priest, but this is true of what God calls in his earthly leaders. God calls them to these Acts 20, 17 to 35. We're just going to roll briefly go with this. That this mirrors what we just read, by the way. This is the Apostle Paul. He knows he's about to be arrested. And he's, 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 he's speaking to the elders of the church of, of Ephesus. So these are the church leaders. He had spent three years with these people, uh, teaching them and raising these elders up. And here's his last words. And they're going to mirror just in a more Pauline way, the exact same thing we just read. He says, now from Miletus, he sent for the, 
to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, the spiritual leaders to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I've lived among you the whole time from the first day to last I set foot in Asia. He says, you know my life. I've lived for the Lord. Did we just read that? That is what the spiritual leaders are called to do primarily. Serving the Lord with all pride and with how awesome I am. No, all humility. All humility with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I preached God's word to you in public, in private. I testified both to the Jews, to the Greeks, to unbelievers, to whoever. I preached the same thing, that you need to repent to God and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish the course of the ministry that was straight from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He's saying, you know what, the suffering is fine because it's not about me. It's about finishing God's calling in my life for his glory and the name of Jesus Christ and not my own name. That is what it is about. And now behold, I know that none of you among you whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the counsel of God that you liked and was just popular. No. I preach you the whole counsel of God, what the whole word of God says, regardless of whether or not you liked it. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Guard your hearts, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which you have came with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in from among you, not sparing the flock. He says false teachers aren't going to come from the outside. They're going to come from people who say they are sheep, but who are not sheep. He said you need to be careful what leaders you lead in and what leaders you follow. And from among yourselves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. I covered no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ on himself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So we see here that he's given this same spiritual calling to priests who are now the spiritual leaders of God's church. But again, Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, be imitators of me as I am Christ. He's saying, as I imitate Christ, we just read how he as a spiritual leader imitated Christ, which mirrors the exact words we just read in Malachi of the calling of spiritual leaders. He says, as these spiritual leaders do this, guess what? You're not exempt. As you see these spiritual leaders doing these things, you too are called to do the same things. It may be different. You may not be in front leading the church, but what you do with your family and your friends, that may be the same calling. Amen? Amen? We need to take it seriously and realize that God has given us each a calling, and it is a command from Him, and it's very specific of how that looks. And why it is so serious, and we'll close with this, is there are consequences for turning away from God's calling. We already briefly mentioned there are consequences when spiritual leaders and you individually ignore God's calling. So in verses 89. But you have turned aside from the way. When this turn aside this isn't just a sharp like left or right turn. It says you have started being wayward. You made one wrong decision. And you know this if you're navigating, if you look on a map, you know, if you're one degree off on a map and you start it not far from the point you started, you're not that far off. But you go way down the line, you're far off by that one degree, right? It just exponentially goes off. That's what's found in that. He's saying that you've, you've not been intentional, you've not been following calling, that you've turned aside from the way, you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. He says, spiritual leaders, when you fall, when you do these things, you are going to cause everyone else that is under you to have the same problem. Well, well, I'm not a spiritual leader. But if you're in the church and people are looking at you and you're friends with them, they're going to say, well, if so-and-so can do it, I can do it too. You see how that spreads? You see how it spreads? There are consequences. And it's not just individualized. He says the whole congregation will stumble and turn away. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. He says you have 
come, you have corrupted me. You've taken what God has designed for good, this covenant with Levi, and turned it into something horrible. And did you know that we can actually do that with the new covenant in Christ? Did you know that? We see this in, in Jude 3 to 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in on notice who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only master, Lord Jesus Christ. He said, There are those that come in that don't have a Holy Spirit here, a reference to God, that say, Since you're saved by grace, do what feels good. Some of us are shaking their head, but that is the gospel that is accepted and preached today. And that is not gospel. That is not biblical. It says, well, come to God. We sing that song. I love that song. Come as you are. But if we're singing the rest of the song, he doesn't leave you there. But we have the world that says, come as you are and celebrate all your sin. But the thing is, is we have spiritual leaders. We don't have a holy reverence for God. And we don't have a holy reverence for God. We start thinking, well, I'm saved. And that's just the way I am. And so that gives us free reign to do sin. There's consequences when we fail God's calling. And that is going to spread. Those on seed come to leave, it corrupts it. And we can corrupt the gospel. The says, Laura, so I make you despise the base before all the people. And so much, do not keep in ways, but show partiality in your instruction. They say that the partiality instruction says, you start playing political favorites. Your congregations, your priests... You've now turned believers into this thing of, well, how much money can they give? You start showing partiality based upon your own human doctrines. And I don't see that ever in churches. I've been in churches that pastors are afraid to preach God's word because it might offend the guy that's the biggest contributor. I'm honest with you, you know, we wish we had someone else to take care of the funds here. Pastor George does it right now, but he, we'd rather not. Because we don't want to know who gives and doesn't give because we don't want to be, not that we do, but why have the temptation of showing partiality based upon earthly things, amen? Why let that be a problem to you? I have no idea who, who gives what, and it's not up to me. And people, a lot of people say, well, you kind of treat everyone kind of the same. I try. <laughs> Do the best I can. I'm not perfect. But the partiality is started because their hearts have forgotten what God has called them to do. And so it spreads. Partiality, favoritism starts spreading throughout the church. And you get the church that it's in Corinth that we just studied, amen? Because it all starts with a lack of reverence for God. It spreads. It spreads. That's why in 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7, Paul encourages Timothy, who as he's setting up elders and calling pastors, he says, As I urge you, I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may be in charge of certain persons, not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and the endless geologies, which are own speculations rather than the stewardship of God, that's by faith. The aim of our charge is that love issues from pure heart and a conscious and a sincere faith. Certain persons, from, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things by which they make confident assertions. They go on to say that I urge you to be conscientious of your spiritual leaders and who you're selecting, that they follow God, pursue His doctrine, pursue His holiness. Because there are plenty that desire to be teachers of law without understanding. It's a very serious thing. Goes on to say in 10, 18 through 20, This charge I trust you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience by rejecting the some have made shipwreck their faith, among whom are Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. He says, God takes this very seriously. He says, there are some bad teachers there that have shipwrecked their faith. And what they're doing is shipwrecking the faith of others because they're not true preaching God's word. They're not sticking to God's uh, faithful calling to them. And he says that I've given them over to Satan to learn not to blasphemy. In other words, that there are consequences when you reject God's calling. And that you may be turned over to Satan to learn your lesson. That's what that says, right? It is what it says. This is that he says that he wants these people to be set out from the church. That they'll be what that means is is God's going to say you don't want me in my calling. Fine, I will let you reap the consequences of what the devil's going to do in your life because you've made that choice. When people read this, they're like, "Well, that's really harsh." That's not really harsh. What he's saying is, is you've denied me and rejected me and didn't want to follow my calling. So I will let Satan wreak havoc because that's what you have chosen. Because that's how serious it is. There are consequences for your life and for the church if you forsake the calling that God has given you. 
that God has given you. And you need to be cautious. You need to say, well, what leaders am I picking in my life? 2 Timothy says, I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge of living the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, repute, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, and having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober minded, endure suffering, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. He's telling Timothy, you may be a pastor and you're doing all these things right. This is your charge and you do all things right, but you may have a people that are going to reject that. This is the other end of the spectrum is, right? He says, there's an there's a obligation for leaders, but there's an obligation for those who are members of the church that they need to pick their leaders and deny their own passion and their itching ears. We've had people leave this church that say, well, you always preach the Bible, and when I leave here, I never feel great about myself. My goal is for you to feel great about Jesus and who he is, because when you look in the mirror, you're not that great. If your comparison is Adolf Hitler, I feel good about myself every day. If Adolf Hitler is my standard, that's not hard to do, but if Jesus is my standard, I shouldn't feel good, but I should feel encouraged that he paid the price, he deserves the glory, and he saved me from myself, Amen. The thing is, is you as an individual, even if you're not a church leader, have the sole duty of being in the scriptures, know what a real leader is supposed to be like, so you can submit yourself to the right type of church and church leader. But meanwhile, we'll close with this. Not only what leader will you follow, but what leader will you be? This is what we'll close with. Ephesians 4, 1-3 says this. Paul says, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He's saying this to individual believers, not to just the pastors and elders. Every one of us has been called, and we are called to walk into that. We all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the spirit and the bond of peace. So I'll leave you with this. What type of leaders are you following? But more importantly, what type of leader is God calling you to be? Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today and we thank you for your word. Uh, we know it's uh, a hard word. When I look at this, it's, it's easy for me to think of others, but I, I'm actually cut to the quick. When I read your word, I, I realize that I do not measure up. But that is why you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my shortcomings, for my weakness, and for my failings as a leader. But my prayer is that where the, the, the flesh is weak, that the spirit would be willing, that we would submit to you, and that your Holy Spirit will strengthen each one of us to fulfill our call uh, that you have called us in Christ Jesus. There may be those that have, who've never heard this type of preaching before or do not know the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray for that person right now that you would work on their heart, that they would give an image of how holy and how awesome you are, but how much you love them by sending your son Jesus to die. And through your death, burial, resurrection, and the trust in, in you, that you've called them out of that life of sin and to be born again into new life. For those of us that have come to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our prayer is that we would uh, stop not taking the call he has given each one of us seriously. I pray for Pastor George and myself as elders of this church and for the other others that you've called into leadership, whether it be in Sunday school or, or you developed them to be elders, that they would take that calling Seriously, because you do. Because the consequences of not fulfilling that call, calling is not just individual, but it spreads to the whole of the church, to the whole of your kingdom, and to the whole of your ministry. For those who don't feel to, to be called to be elders or things like that, Lord, I just pray that you impress upon them that they are called to do something. They have called them to some type of ministry, whether that is to, to serving their families and being a spiritual leader there, or to step up where there are gaps in this church that would be filled, Lord, and that they would not look to themselves, but would look to you for the strength to do it, because you will equip the call, Lord. So again, we just ask that our church would be one that would seek first to preach your truth, regardless if it's popular, that we would be a church that has a high view of your word, a high view of, of who you are as a holy and living God, that we would have a, an understanding of our own brokenness and our sin nature, and that we would preach in boldness that need to repent and to turn to Christ, to be born again, and then from there to grow in your word, to fulfill the calling you have for each and every one of us. 
Again, we thank you and love you and ask that you be glorified in our church and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.